The scripture today is from Mark 10, chapter 10, verse 17 through 31. He was setting out on a journey. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it, it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold in his age houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Discipleship 101. <laughs> Jesus kind of starts out with um, a slogan that I'm not sure... Um, is the best slogan in the world. I mean, when you really are drawn into something that sounds exciting and good and, and something that you want to follow, um, it usually doesn't sound like, let's take up the cross, right? I mean, I can even remember one of my favorite slogans as a young, probably middle school, teenager, I don't even know the, the exact year. Um, but I remember it well because I used it all the time in places where it just, it just felt like, you know, you were in a good place. And, and the slogan was, um, it just doesn't get any better than this. I actually think it was a beer commercial. You know, like, I, it had nothing to do with, with that for me because, like, but... But you know how at least everybody in this room, pretty much, were inundated with commercials? You know, you couldn't just skip, skip through them or totally cancel them out, pay a little bit more and get that out of the way. So commercials were always in your face, and they always had jingles, and they always had, like, these marketing slogans. Don't you think that would have been a better, like, discipleship slogan? It just doesn't get any better than this, right? Well, I'm sure it sold a whole lot of beer. Um, but Jesus didn't use that. He comes to this text, and, and uh, he's already told the disciples that it's going to be hard. You, you know, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. And so we're exploring that in the next, next few weeks and continuing weeks, and, and, and I want you to really be thinking about, you know, 
what it is that draws you to follow this type of slogan. This kind of marketing uh, is, is um, perplexing to me. But, but we have to remember, too, I think that we live in a context where that particular marketing slogan, um, I don't know that it would fly today any better than it did then. Um, I mean, I'm surprised that Jesus didn't realize, okay, the context, okay, the cross in my day is a symbol of um, persecution and execution. Yeah, let's use that horrible execution symbol. Um, it was the, the means of their foreign occupiers, um, the Romans, who exerted power over the people um, that was one of the, the tools that they used to scare people into submission. Um, it wasn't something anybody wanted to pick up. Nobody wanted to pick up the cross and, and take it on. And, and um, I think it was something that was much feared. I mean, the last thing you would do is want to um, be a part of that, that following. But even though it may have been the worst marketing slogan, it definitely still has impact for us today. Um, we have to look at that, that that's where Jesus started. That they said, it's going to be work, it's going to be hard. And the reason he did that is because he had this young whippersnapper, rich, I don't know, I think uh, several years ago there was some kind of... Um, phrase coined about the Henrys of the world, you know, uh, young people who, who are rich early, but, but not yet, you know, um, fully done with their, their work life. I mean, it, it's this, this idea that this young person who obviously has gained everything that the world might uh, uh, offer still has this concern, well, what else do I need to do? I think he was a real success-driven, you know, uh, performing kind of person, and, and, and he wanted to do well. He wanted to, to excel, and he wanted to be excellent. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? But, but he does come with this perplexing question. He says, what do I have to do? What would I have to do to, to be a part of your following? What would I have to do to inherit this um, eternal life that, that you're promising? And so Jesus gives him the Disciple 101, you know, basic info, skill test. Well, what, is, what does Scripture say? You know, what are the things that, that you need to be doing? Uh, here's the commandments. And you ought to notice that Jesus doesn't go through all ten commandments. I think he just goes through about five of them. But they're all the five that deal with relating with other people. Notice that in the scripture. It's all about the relational ones. You know, you can end a relationship real quick if you murder someone. Or lie, or cheat, or steal. Um, I think those are, those are pretty, pretty high, much highlighted. Honor your mother and father. Don't defraud. Don't speak ill will against other people. Um, don't commit adultery. I mean, those are all relationship commandments based on, on other people. Well, that's easy. I haven't done any of those. He's probably too young. He may have not even been married yet. You know, he may, who knows? He may still be living with his mother and father, <laughs> making his money. And, 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 but he says, I've, I've kept all these since my youth. And Jesus looking at him. And did you hear, Felicia, I, I love the, the emphasis, what I heard. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Loved him. Jesus loved him. And then he spoke the next truth. Jesus loved him, and he said, you lack one thing. You lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now doesn't that sound, doesn't that sound like a relationship with other people kind of thing? 
Like, we would just be okay at the end of the day if we sold everything we had and gave it to everybody else. I don't think that's what Jesus meant. I do think Jesus means a whole lot in this context. But in particularly, I think Jesus is saying, your heart is so obsessed and possessed by by your possessions and the things that you've accumulated, which tells me a whole lot about you've been real focused on, on, on what you can do. But I think this particular thing that he lacked is tied to the very first commandment, which is love the Lord and let him be the, o- you know, the only one that we worship. Right? That's the first commandment. Jesus didn't say that commandment. But then he gets into this big discussion about giving everything that you have, all that you have, to the poor. And I think it had something to do with the idolatry in the young man's heart. His security, his trust, everything was based on on what he had accumulated. And so therefore, that's the one thing that was lacking. He didn't trust He didn't find his security and his total life resource in the one who actually gives it. I think that's, I I, I think Jesus is on to something, you know, because he's like, this is the one thing you lack. And, And I'm telling you, even the disciples didn't get it. That's okay. You ever been in those classes with people who are like knocking you like this and going, do you understand what the professor's saying? Can I have your notes when we're done? Because I'm totally lost. They're like, holy cow, we got to give everything up. We've already done that. Look, I'm already in, in Kahoot. You know, I'm, I've already given up my, my livelihood. I left the nets in the boat. My whole family's upset with me because I've gone off wandering around and they're wondering what I'm doing. I mean, they, they'd given what they thought was everything and yet they were still hearing this, but you got to give all this stuff to the poor. Who are really important in Jesus's, you know, life and mind. The poor are, were the dispossessed, the marginalized, and, and those who were counted as unclean and sinners. Obviously, you wouldn't be poor unless you did something that created that lifestyle to make you poor. You know, there was, there was a lot of judgment. I mean, we don't have any of that kind of judgment in our world today, do we? But... But they're confused, and they're wondering, golly, you know, we thought we signed up for this, but now he's talking about giving every possession we have. I mean, does that mean the, the sandwich in my pocket that I was hoping to have for lunch? I mean, they're, they're confused. They're perplexed. But Jesus said to them, all of them again, he said, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And I love this illustration, um, partially because I think it made, it came to life and made more sense to me after listening to another preacher when I was, you know, much younger, who explained what the eye of the needle was, because obviously I grew up at the foot of my grandmother and the sewing circle ladies at the church. So when I think of eye of a needle, I think of the eye of a needle you thread, right? That is a stinking small hole, isn't it? I mean, that that has an image of impossibility. Like, it's hard for people who have wealth and possessions to get to the kingdom of God because it's like this. Well, then why even try? I mean, you know, that was that was a young, young person's uh, version. And then one day someone said, oh, the eye of the needle was what they called the gate into Jerusalem, into, into the, the city. And in order to get through it, it was a narrow gate. You know why? Because that's kind of how fortresses are built. You don't want a wide, like, there were no four-lane highways going into main cities, Right? That's too hard to cut off if you're trying to shut uh, in traffic. 
So the eye of the needle was the entrance point where the guards, you know, sat, and, and often there were people there, the poor were there, um, that, that, that they would panhandle there, and, and that was a good place to, to maybe catch a, a, a weary traveler with, with possessions. Because what happened at the eye of the needle is that if you were carrying a bunch of stuff on a, on a camel, they actually had to unload the whole camel in order for the camel to fit through the gate and then reload it once it got, you know, once they got everybody on the other side. Now that feels at least somewhat feasible to me. And then I can always imagine Jesus somewhere in the story, he's probably got an eye on the needle, per se, and it just was an illustration that popped in his head. And he's like, it is hard. It is hard when you have loaded up your camel with so much possession to enter into trusting and being within the presence and the kingdom of God that is right in front of you. I don't know why Jesus talked in such ways, keeping it kind of uh, coded, metaphorical, illustrative in his his storytelling and parables. I think it has something to do with just how we tune in to our spiritual languages and 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 spiritual uh, senses than when we're focused literally on our worldly understandings. Does that make sense? Um, So at least for me, that was huge when I realized, oh, that makes sense. Eye of the needle, a gate, camels can't go through. They're too wide. It's the wide load. Got to take that off, and then you can carry on. They were greatly astounded. (laughs) And they said to everybody, each other, like, well, then who can be saved? And that's when we hear that wonderful phrase that sometimes we get all messed up in the way we use it. Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. The disciples probably had some friends, you know, they were like, that's just, that's impossible. I don't know how you do it. How do you do it? How do you carry all that you carry? We should get really agile in our discipleship. Just saying, hey, this cross I'm carrying, I ain't carrying it. If I was trying to carry my cross, and let me tell you, I have tried. Um, That is impossible. At some point, our strength gives way, and we can't carry it anymore. Because for God, it's possible, not for us. And then he comes towards that end. He recognizes, I think, again, you could add that phrase, God loved them, Jesus loved them. He said, truly, I know, you've left everything. You've left brothers and sisters and and family. But then he gives this promise. You will receive in the age to come the greatest gift, the great gift of eternal life, the fullness of God's presence. You get to live in it and be in it forever when we put God first. That's the cross that we have to pick up. And picking it up, I think, has everything to do with that very last verse, which we will talk about next week. For many who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first. But today, we just have to choose to pick it up. 
We can't walk away sad and thinking that it's impossible what God may call us to exchange and to let go of, to maybe get off of our back so we can enter into the gate where life is. Will you pray with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the invitation. The invitation to offer ourselves to make a radical sacrifice that isn't always the most popular uh, slogan. We don't see it on billboards. We don't see it on t-shirts. We just see it in front of us with the invitation that says, come, take it up, and the return for you will be incalculable. Bless us now, O God, as we continue to worship you and offer all that we are for the sake of your kingdom. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.